Uh, welcome. My name is Greg Andrus. I'm the Vice President of the Democratic Party of Evanston. Uh, this is part of our ongoing video series uh, with the municipal candidates for this upcoming election cycle. Uh, for those of you who have been members for a long time, you may remember uh, some of our previous endorsement events where we all gather together at the Unitarian Church and we give each of the candidates two, three minutes to speak on stage and then you all vote. Um, this year, of course, we're doing everything a little bit differently. Um, so our uh, ballots are going out to members on January 17th. Uh, they are due back in on January 23rd. Um, so if you're not a member yet, you can join as a member through our website. Um, either as a dues paying member or if you're interested in uh, getting a membership through volunteering. Um, we have a couple of events coming up. There's a voter registration drive um, and there are a couple of special elections that have just been announced that we can get you hooked up with. So just reach out to us if you wanna, if you wanna become a member by volunteering. Um, so I'm joined here today with Claire Kelly who is running for uh, first ward alderman. Um, and Claire, why don't you uh, take a minute or two here and introduce yourself. All right, so I'm Claire Kelly, and yes, I'm running for First Ward Alderman. I am just about a lifelong um, Evanston resident since I was eight, and I'm also a teacher at Evanston Township High School. I'm just um, wrapping up my career so that I can jump in uh, and work for the city and for the residents. I've been teaching at Evanston Township High School for 30 years. I raised two boys in Evanston, uh, Nico and Gus. They both went through the public school systems and have now graduated from college. Um, I've been involved in a lot of city efforts, um, some successful efforts. A lot of people know me from um, the really amazing effort um, that the Evanston community did to close down the Northwestern University Medical Waste Incinerator at the hospital. Um, that took a huge uh, collaboration across the community with wonderful residents who and experts and everybody put their heads together and we um, and we were able to effectively, within a year, um, convince our city council to do the right thing and to vote to pass an ordinance to uh, ban medical waste incineration. And as a result of that, I mean, our community is so much healthier, our ward is so much healthier as a result of that. But not only that, I just have to add this, that, um, that effort, um, the Sierra Club then took me to, down, took me to Springfield to debate, to discuss with the Senate um, about passing legislation at the state level which as a result of our Evanston effort, this led to state legislation also um, to restrict medical waste incineration. And that in turn led to national legislation. So our Evanston community, we were effective in improving air quality across this nation. Um, and you know, the thing that's also kind of special is that frequently and mostly these incinerators were located um, in low income communities. And so, you know, our wonderful mix of Evanston people here, we had um, from all walks of life could come together. And like, I worked with my neighbor and good friend, Matt Winia, Dr. Winia, who was um, the director of the AMA's, uh, uh, let's see, it's uh, the bioethics, the Center on Bioethics, as well as other experts in the field. So anyway, we just have a fabulous Evanston community. And that I think is just a great example of what, what we can do in Evanston. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so our first question, uh, it's uh, uh, how well do you feel the city of Evanston has upheld its goal of assessing decisions and policies through a lens of equity? So, you know, I think Evanston, um, our city government, uh, does an excellent job of talking about equity. I think they, you know, dedicate a good amount of time of talking about. However, I have to say, um, I think the policies as they've played out have had a disparate impact um, against our, our people of color in this community. I think um, that frequently there's a lot of talk about uh, you know, the need to look at things through a lens of equity. But when we um, were you know, one of the top, nation, top cities in the nation for property tax burden, and that has had such a negative impact on the diversity of our town, um, and we continue now in the middle of the pandemic, um, our aldermen, five of our aldermen voted yet again to raise taxes. And these sort of expenditures um, are, have, I mean, we can look at the, the demographic maps from over the years and see what's happened. Our African-American population has declined significantly over the years. Um, so clearly what we're doing, um, basically what we're, we're not doing enough. We're not implementing policies that really have the kind of impact that we should have. In fact, the policies that we are have been 
carrying out decisions that have been made um, have had a negative impact overall on, on the really fundamental things of have quality of living and being able to just even live in Evanston. So um, I appreciate the, the um, this is really good in raising consciousness. So I applaud that, but we absolutely have to be um, doing a better job at looking at our budget and never forgetting that our budget is a moral document, um, that this really is the blueprint of our priorities. And clearly um, this has been a little bit skewed, um, not, not, not towards really helping um, our lower income population and our minority people in Evanston. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to go on in that area. I also think I just want to add also, I think, you know, we haven't seen enough resolve from council members in terms of really trying to get Northwestern to um, pay more, to um, contribute more to Evanston. It's really at the bottom when you look at, it's one of the, it is in the top 10 for wealthy um, universities in terms of its endowment. And yet it's, you know, at the bottom in terms of what it gives back to its city. So if we really care about, you know, equity in our city, we would really have the resolve to negotiate um, until we get a fair contribution out of Northwestern. Uh, thank you. Um, so the next couple of questions uh, concern policing. Uh, the first one uh, that came to us from one of our members, um, how do you go about listening to and weighing conflicting calls from constituents, uh, some of whom want less uh, conventional police presence and, and those who want more? So, you know, I think one thing that we have to keep in mind, frequently I think there's this polarization that takes place. And I think on both sides, sometimes there's elements that want to feed a polarization. And I think everybody cares about safety from both sides. And I think there's a tendency to want to think that, you know, the people that speak of defund, like they aren't about safety. Everybody wants safety in our community. And I, so I think in large part, I think what we have to do is make sure we all are listening to each other and understanding the facts um, and understanding what can really bring us and get us the safest community and what are the measures that can be taken. And so um, I think in this case around the police, again, I think um, people on either side aren't necessarily hearing each other and what their concerns are. But I think if we educate both sides, each other, as to what our concerns are and what measures can effectively be taken to ensure that we have safe communities. And when I mean safe, I mean safe from crime, but I also mean safe from being harassed and, and you know, by police if you're um, you know, a person of color. So there's safety issues on both sides, and, but, but we all want safe communities. And I think sometimes there's this misinterpretation that the defund you know, people just aren't about um, ensuring that our communities are safe. So I think um, there's also a lot of communities that we should be looking towards as models. We, I don't think we need to talk about this like we're inventing this. And I think that's also a problem a lot of times is that we're not providing um, enough examples. I think we have a lot of the Kahoot programs in um, like Eugene, Oregon, Portland, Denver, across this nation that have been implementing wonderful policies, policies um, that have relied on a reduced police presence and more social work presence. Um, so I think it's all about, again, hearing both sides, bringing the facts to the table and looking at what will best serve our community and not to pull, I think we have to be really careful not to, not to feed into the polarization. So that's what I would see as my role would be to ensure that, that we really, because I do think Evanston's essentially just a fabulous community with fabulous residents. And I know that we can resolve the concerns and issues on both sides together with um, a solution that's that everybody that most people certainly can be happy with. Um, so as a follow up to that, um, do you feel that the city has done enough to assure black and brown uh, residents that they're not being unfairly policed and that individual officers are, are held accountable? Um, so again, I appreciate the discourse that the city has, um, you know, um, taken up on this topic, but I, I do think that um, the responses to some of the issues that have come up, some of the videos that we've seen of our residents, of our residents of color being harassed by police, there has not been a swift enough response. Um, so no, I don't think, I think it needs to be taken much more seriously. Um, and I think we need to make, um, we, I think a swift response and a serious response will help bring more trust um, to our community. But I think at this point now, there's been people have felt the need to, um, you know, to scream and shout to try to get people's attention about some of the, some of the abuse that has happened. And 
So I do think there need, um, that we have fallen short in terms of addressing some of the abuse um, and, and fears that people in our community, particularly Black and Latino, Latinx people feel um, with regard to abuse of power. Um, thank you. Uh, so the next question is on FOIAs, um, especially those made of the Evanston Police Department um, have become something of a contentious issue lately in city council meetings. Um, what do you believe the city can do to promote transparency and accountability when it comes to uh, FOIAs and police FOIAs? So I think the whole, we've had a real issue with transparency over um, for several years now. And I think it obviously also pertains to the police department. Um, I think immediately we need to, um, um, I, I think what we're, we haven't been looking, we've been looking, residents have felt very cut off from information. Um, there have been many, many appeals to the attorney general's PAC office, and this shouldn't be necessary. Um, we have found that our city officials have frequently violated um, Open Meetings Act, they've um, Open Records Act. And so I think there's a culture at our city council that has, um, that has unfortunately uh, restricted the flow of information. Uh, I think Clerk Reed was doing a phenomenal job in trying to bring more transparency to our city. Um, I think it's unfortunate that it has, um, over the past four years, I feel like there has been a clamping down on information. Um, and I think, you know, Clerk Reed laid out, I think it was with the attorney, sort of the foremost attorney in FOIA law, um, attorney topic, they had laid out a plan for a FOIA policy that basically just got ignored by our city council. I mean, this was amazing that we could have someone of such high esteem in the FOIA world um, sit down and actually help craft out policy for our city and then to have it disregarded. Um, this is problematic. So I hope with our next city government that we will um, provide far more transparency, um, revisit that document that Clerk Reed and uh, Attorney Topic worked on and bring much more um, transparency to city government. Thank you very much. Um, so the, the next question uh, while we're on the topic of police oversight, um, so there have been uh, critics of the current system uh, for investigating police mis misconduct, which is currently done by a board which is appointed by the mayor and, and approved by city council. Um, do you believe that that board um, is, is uh, adequate or do you feel that there should be a, a board independent of um, the mayor's and, and city council? I think we should have an independent board. Um, I, think, um, I think it should be its own, uh, its own line item in terms of the budget. I think it should be separately funded, um, its own uh, sort of budget, uh, body. And I think it's really important that these are not people who are appointed. Um, this is so vital to the trust and to the culture of our town. Um, to leave it up to somebody appointing people um, is not going to um, bring the sort of reform that we need in our city. And I'd like to just, you know, hat tip the work, the fine work of CNP. They have done such remarkable work over the years with attorneys, um, research, and you know, I think we absolutely have to acknowledge, embrace, and, and hear from them and become educated by the group that um, CNP is. Uh, I mean, it's a remark, I mean, that's what makes Evanston so wonderful. These are people that have given up their time, volunteer time over 10 years now um, to research what it takes to run an effective police oversight, an independent police oversight board. And again, they haven't been given the sort of time, respect, and acknowledgement that they should be given volunteers, right? Just um, sweat time, 10 years worth, and you know, thousands of hours worth of work and attorneys, and again, not embraced and not given the respect, not given, um, we should be absolutely tapping into their work, for example. Um, so the, the final question I have on policing um, uh, uh, is on a specific issue, a uh, specific incident that happened. Um, so recently, the city of Evanston made use of the Northern Illinois Police Alarm System, the, the NIPAS or, or NIPAS, um, to respond to protests, uh, specifically on the, on the Halloween uh, incident. Um, do you believe the level of oversight the city has over NIPAS is sufficient? Um, and what would you do to make this relationship more transparent and accessible to Evanston residents? So I think there is an issue um, when we bring in 
reinforcements, armed reinforcements, people with lethal weapons into our city whom we cannot get access information. So, I mean, we can bring in other services, that's fine, right? But when we're talking about bringing in a body into our city, again, with lethal weapons, but yet we don't have access, we don't have, we can't FOIA this group. I'm gonna say, I'm, I, you know, I know a lot of people are talking about how they have to behave better, how they have to, NIPA has to, or, um, NIPA, right, has to adhere better to our standards. But in my opinion, there are other ways there are other public bodies that we can rely on for reinforcements if we need them. And we should absolutely exhaust that. I mean, we do that, for example, you know, we need a third ambulance in Evanston. We don't have one. We have a reserve one. That's a different story. We've, we've relied on Wilmette sometimes, frequently, when we need another ambulance. There are other public bodies that we should be relying on first before we go to a private organization by which we cannot FOIA. I saw the pictures of the men with you know, their name tags covered up. This is just unacceptable. And then we can't FOIA and get information. No, and again, it's because this is a contract for people to come in with lethal, lethal weapons. We should not be, in my opinion, um, we should exhaust all other possibilities with other public bodies first. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the next uh, the next couple of questions are a little bit broader, um, and they cover the the government itself. Um, so, is there anything about the culture of our city government that you would like to see changed? Um, so, I think residents have felt over the last four years um, that their voice overall has not been embraced or encouraged. So, what I would like to see. Um, improved in, the, in city council is resident voice, that we embrace, that we encourage, that we applaud resident participation, even if it, there's some emotion in it, emotion is information for us, but we should not at any point be trying to discourage it. And I think sometimes residents have felt like they're a nuisance to city council. Um, you know, there have been times when um, aldermen have arbitrarily restricted speaking time you know, and then been found in violation of OMA. I mean, that's just unacceptable. When residents come out after working all day and come out because they're concerned and they care about their city, we should embrace this, applaud this, and, and, and encourage more of it. We shouldn't be, so that's, that I would say would be the number one um, sort of aspect of the culture that I'd like to see improved. Um, All right. Um, so the second, uh, the second question I have on this, on this vein, um, can you comment on the benefits and or challenges of Evanston's home rule status? And um, what are your opinions on the, uh, the current council manager form of government? So I think, um, I think we, you know, I know we're all kind of proud of our home rule status, and I think there are many benefits to home rule. But I will advocate that we do a serious cost benefit analysis of home rule. There are communities in Illinois that have um, put home rule, have, have put on the referendum to do away with home rule, like Rockford. Um, the residents did not want home rule because they found that their city government was um, spending money recklessly and it was costing them dearly. Because if we weren't home rule, for example, the Robert Crown Center, the amount of money that they took out in bonds, they could not have done that without a referendum. So by not having home rule, now we're stuck with 20 years with three to $5 million that we have to figure out how to come up with. And there really isn't a plan on how to pay that other than raising taxes. So, um, so I think we really need to sit down and I, you know, I understand that the, all the benefits of home rule and the independence, but we really need to look at the cost um, and the benefits of that and determine whether this has really been good for Evanstonians. The, Ro the people in Rockford and a couple of other communities in Illinois, um, their city government put it, wanted to put it back a referendum up again because they wanted to get their home rule back and the residents once again voted it down. They don't want home rule because they're afraid of more reckless spending. So we've definitely seen this and that's one of the reasons I'm running because the way that we have um, the way that our budget has been what I feel very mismanaged. So I'm not saying we should go there, but I think it's something we absolutely have to look at. Oh, and in terms of what was the other part of that question? Oh, um, uh, any thoughts on the current council manager form of government? 
Yeah, so also that, I would say that's something we should look at the cost benefit analysis. Um, I think that right now, I feel like we have deferred way too, our city council has deferred way too much to, I feel like upper management has been pretty much calling the shots too much. Um, and I think that that needs to turn around and that might be, maybe that's more viable if we have an elected, you know, if that's an elected position as opposed to a city manager, I don't know. But I do think that um, it is possible that the accountability might be stronger um, if we had, as opposed to a city manager, you know, if we had it in the form of, of a mayor that was paid to be a city manager and elected. But I don't know. Again, I think that we, I think that's another part of the culture. I think we need people who are ready to, um, who are detail oriented, who are ready to look at every, every cost, um, every expenditure, and, and really scrutinize everything that staff is putting before us and tell staff like for example with our city budget we've said we're no ta no more rate no more tax hikes i mean that should have been a mandate to our staff instead they came back and said oh we need to raise taxes and then everybody responded so i think that um that needs to change the order of command okay uh so moving on uh, to the next uh, to the next subject um, Evanston has the Climate Action Resilience Plan, uh, which has the goal of a carbon neutral Evanston uh, by the year 2050, along with some, some interstitial goals. Um, what do you feel are the largest challenges we face in reaching that goal? And do you feel that the current goal is ambitious enough, or would you like to see some changes made? So, I um, no, I think it's... I think it's ambitious enough. I think it involves education, but I think it involves a lot more. And I think if we're serious about it, we need to start looking at policy and, um, and codes that we can actually implement in order to ensure that we get there. We can't rely on sort of volunteerism. Uh, we can't rely on, on simply you know, getting the word out. I think we absolutely have to look at what kind of policies, what kind of codes, what kind of building codes do we need to implement? So for example, um, I think uh, we're gonna need to look at, I think by the year 2030, if we wanna get, if we figure like that heaters, when you get your boilers, they last about 20 years. By 2030, we're gonna have to have some codes in the book um, where um, by 2030, you know, there's strict building codes about what you can build with and restricting the use of natural gas. So. Um, that we're going to have to start looking at putting on the books now because that's only eight years away so that when people are planning or building or looking to buy a house, um, this is our, we, we're going to have to do that immediately. And I think um, that's of urgency right now to put some policies on the book if we really intend to, to get to that goal. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so the, the next question concerns the budget and um, it's, it's fairly broad. Um, do you feel overall that the expenditures by the city of Evanston over the last four years um, have appropriately reflected the priorities, needs, and interests of Evanston residents? No. Um, we have spent an exorbitant amount of money um, that, has, that has caused us once again have a property tax increase. Again, we are one of the top cities in the nation for, for tax burden. Um, yet we have, I teach at Evanston High School and the population there is close to 40% low income. Um, and it's like we're trying to create a very rarefied city that's you know, not, not accessible um, for even middle income people. So for example, I'm gonna mention the Robert Crown Center. And you know, that was the most expensive project in Evanston's history. Most of the cost of that $55 million project went to two hockey rinks. So again, we say our priorities, um, our top priority is to look at our decisions, our expenses through a lens of equity. I asked what happened there when they made that decision. Um, you know, it doesn't take much to look at the demographics. Hockey's a great sport, not knocking it, but two, not one, but two NHL hockey rinks. And again, most of the expense went towards those. And not only that, um, you know, that decision to build that went to, it didn't go to the lowest bidder. I mean, we had initially the highest ranked um, construction firm that responded by quantifiable measures was more than $10 million less than who we ended up paying. But when they went into the private interview process, they decided because, you know, they liked the other firm more, they knew them better, 
you know, and they thought they might meet the end up the minority women local hiring practice better, they decided to hire them for over $10 million. Now, mind you, I could go on about the pension, the fireman and policeman pension, which is scandalous. I mean, the amount that we are underfunded and the little amount it would take for us to fully fund at 100%, and this gets a little complicated, but for about $2 million more, $3 million a year more, we could be fully funding at 100% that, that, that pension. But instead, our taxes keep going up every year because we're funding at 90%. But mind you, we go and we spend $55 million, $10 million more on the Robert Crown Center than we needed to spend. Oh, and by the way, the, the MWB committee later assessed that they hadn't even been meeting the minority women in local hiring. So, you know, so they voted to fine them $400,000. Meanwhile, we had already decided to spend 10 million more. Then there's the $8 million lawsuit in James Park, right? So that started out 100,000, 200,000 of our tax dollars. Even, even environmental attorneys were saying, stop, you don't really have a case, you don't have the evidence, stop. They spent 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, they kept losing all the way up to $8 million and they lost the case. Even the judge was wondering what was going on in Evanston. That served nothing for us. And again, the policeman and fireman's pension to fully fund that, we're talking maybe $3 million more a year but do you, and, and I just want to grab these figures because I think it's really important that the public understand this. Um, on, let me see if I have these here. We are, because we haven't been funding, um, one moment, I, oh, let's see if I lost this. Well, at any rate, so it went up from in about two, two years. Um, give me just a moment because I think it's so important that the public know this. <laughs> just from not, from not funding, at um, 100 percent. So in, um, in 2000 and um, let's see, in 2016, I think we were at, oh, anyway, we were at about 100 and um, we were at about 180 million. And 70 percent of that is just catch up money because we had screwed up in our projected estimates of rate of return. So in two years later, the, what we now owe, the residents now, we owe $241 million. So it's gone up by like 60, $70 million in just two years. We are now that much more in the hole because we are not funding at 100%. And I realize this is probably not a good topic for this. But at any rate, my point is that we're, we're just, we're way overspending in areas that are unnecessary, the Robert Crown, and we're, and, and, you know, and this is just ridiculous. And meanwhile, we're not funding our, you know, our cherished fire department at 100% of their pension. And we could be very easily. And instead, we're paying for it in our taxes. Every year it's going up. It's increasing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for that thorough answer. Uh, and I want to add, if we, also Northwestern, um, again, um, Marty Lines, the former you know, CFO, said they're sitting on about between 30 and $40 million worth of property tax money. Now, I'm not saying they have to pay that, but certainly they could pay a lot more. And there's plenty of cities around this country that have addressed that through, the, through pilot programs, payment in lieu of taxes, Boston being one, and, and really um, great programs. We don't have to invent the wheel on this. And I'm actually in communications with people in Boston about their their pilot program where they develop a pilot task force and then establish pilot payment in lieu of taxes guidelines. Um, and it's been incredibly effective. They started in 2012 and every year the amount that's been, has increased from the nonprofit universities. Um, so I, I'd like to move on to the next question. Um, <laughs> uh, so even before the pandemic, um, it seemed as though downtown Evanston was full of empty storefronts. And of course, the pandemic has just, just made that worse. Um, what do you believe can be done to promote development in a way that prioritizes small business and local ownership? Um, so, yeah, so I think small businesses should be a very, very much a type, top priority for our city, um, especially right now. And, I, and again, I, I don't think we're doing enough. Um, to support our small businesses. There was a small grant that was actually taken from the relief from the federal relief fund that were given, but there are many things that we could be doing. There are many things that cities across this nation are doing to support their small businesses. On my website, I list a whole bunch of those um, 
things that we could be doing to really support and to help ensure that our small businesses survive through the pandemic and not only survive, but um, succeed through the pandemic. Um, some towns have done things like bought gift certificates for $30 for every household, spending $20,000, $30,000. Um, other cities have invested in, in um, for example, in, in closing off streets so that they could be more accessible for, um, to bring people in. They've invested in heat, outdoor heaters, tents for their small businesses. All of this will bring us many returns. And it, you know, it, it will bring through revenue, but it'll also improve quality of living and ensure that our cities, you know, we maintain the integrity of our downtown and everything that's special about Evanston. So um, there's also certain ordinances, um, they're like big box ordinances that can be passed to sort of ensure that um, our small businesses um, are somewhat protected and have more opportunity to grow. I think we should look at some of those. Um, I think they're called, um, I forget what they're called, but anyway, they're like big box ordinances that uh, that limit some of the proliferation of big box um, businesses. So I think absolutely we need to look at. There's so so many things that cities across the nation have done that I think, and I think we've failed, we've really um, fallen short on supporting our small businesses um, during the pandemic. Okay, so uh, the next question we're moving from uh, commercial development to residential development. Um, despite the number of new residential units constructed in Evanston over the last few years, um, especially in some of these high-rise developments, um, housing costs in Evanston continue to go up. Do you feel that the inclusionary housing ordinance is doing enough to combat this? And what other solutions would you like to see implemented? So I was disappointed, you know, people spoke of our improved inclusionary housing ordinance. I think it actually has been weakened. Um, even before we had a 10% affordable housing, um, an, an inclusionary housing ordinance of 10%, meaning that if you had a planned development, someone wanting a variance, um, they would put in, it was recommended that they put in 10%. We've reduced that to 5%. Even at 10%, again, that was really bare bones um, by IHO standards. Now we've reduced it to 5%, saying that they then have to pay in lieu. Well, yeah, I think we can strengthen that. Um, I think we need to go back and strengthen our inclusionary housing ordinance. I don't think that was the right move. Um, people look at our city and look at how it, the demographics have changed. Um, that we, over the years, our um, African-American population has been moved essentially further west and south. And when we reduce our inclusionary housing ordinance the way we did, we're ensuring, we're sort of cementing that even more. So I think we need to go back. I think also, you know, this is Evanston. This is like just an amazing city, in an amazing location, right? On the lakefront next to a, uh, you know, world-class university, everything else. Developers want to come here. And we frequently, we see that our aldermen act like, you know, almost like we're a blighted city. We have to just take whatever we can get. And if they throw us a few um, affordable housing units, we're happy. Well, you know, that needs to stop. Um, developers will come. They're not going to walk away if we hold their feet to the fire. And we just need to be clear on what we want. We're not, we should not be responding to what developers want. Developers need to know what we want here in Evanston. And I think that will help dramatically um, with our around issues of afford affordability. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so the, the next question concerns the first ward uh, directly. Um, and I'm trying to you know, include a question for, for each of the candidates that's specific to their ward. Um, the first ward, uh, having the, the downtown area where you know, there's a lot of a lot of traffic, a lot of density. Um, I've gotten some questions from from people about parking rates, uh, parking meters, parking availability, and and ticketing. Um, so, for with everybody who's who's concerned that the, the it's too difficult to park, too difficult to find parking, too expensive to afford parking, um, how would you how would you address that in the densest part of the city? Um. Well, I think it is too expensive, and I think this is hurting our small businesses. This is yet another measure that I think it, um, was not um, well thought out to jack up. And again, we're scrambling now because there have been so many reckless, I'm sorry, but just, and I hate to be so negative, but reckless expenditures. So now we're scrambling um, on how to cover, cover these expenses. Um, so I would say, 
So the question is, what should we do in terms of lack of parking space? Um, both in parking availability and parking cost. Right. So I think the parking cost is too high. Um, I would say we should keep it. We should keep the parking availability that we have. I know there's been talk of selling off a garage. I don't think we should be selling off public assets at this point. Um, I think these absolutely serve and help our small businesses. And, and that, again, brings us many returns. Um, we do, we do not want to make it more restrictive. I know people already that travel to other cities to go shopping because it's such a, you know, it's so expensive to park downtown. This is not, this has not been a good decision. So I would absolutely advocate for um, reduce, reducing our parking fees and keeping the availability that we have right now for parking. But I, you know, and, and I'm keeping in mind, I know that as the, the green trend is to try to, you know, sort of reduce the amount of parking spaces so that people use more public transportation. And I'm all about that too, but I think that's a longer term plan. We need to look at that and how we're gonna provide uh, adequate public transportation, um, bike paths and everything else um, so that people can do without a car. But until we have that plan in place, um, because I do think it's important to figure out ways how we can reduce the use of cars, um, I think right now we have to um, make, make downtown as accessible as possible. We need to protect um, our downtown and ensure that it, that it thrives and survives and succeeds. Um, so the last few questions I have, um, I'm, these are the, the, the questions that I've been asking all of the, um, the non-incumbents, all of the challengers. So the first one is, um, why, why aldermen? So of all the ways to sort of throw your hat in the ring and, and help out the public, why, why run for aldermen? So, you know, I, like I say, I, I love this town. Um, I care tremendously about it. I've been teaching for 30 years. I also care about ETHS and the school districts, um, but I've been very involved um, politically and in other ways in the city. And I'm, I know we can do much, much better by our residents. And I've been disappointed in what I've seen over the last four years, so much so that something has to change. And I have an idea and I have a plan and I have a goal. Um, and I am a very goal-oriented person, and um, I know that we can do better by our, our, our Black and our Latinx population as well. I think we talk about diversity, but we're not really implementing the sort of policy that protects the diversity of this town. And I'm, I'm tired of watching it and struggling against it from the outside. I have had some successes from the outside, but um, I am hell-bent to ensure that we make this a place that's inclusive for everybody. Um, and that we move in a better direction in Evanston. And I think the best place for me to do it at this point, I am, like I said, I'm gonna be retiring is um, by representing the first ward, which I also you know, love tremendously. It's an amazing ward, um, but in city council. Okay, and the, the final question I have for you, um, you're running against Judy Fisk, uh, who's, been, who's the first ward alderman. Um, what uh, decision of hers um, would you say you agree with? So, um, so yeah, big hat to, to Judy on her work um, in helping to establish the historic district. Um, I, I think that was wonderful effort that she, um, you know, really took a lead in. Uh, that's been really beneficial to our community. I think that that, you know, represents, um, that is our community, that's our history. And so I really, I really do applaud her for her work um, to establish the historic district in our ward. Thank you very much. Um, so at the end here, um, I'd like to I'd like to give you the chance to take questions from the from the audience. And I see we have a, a couple of people who've joined us in the Zoom meeting. Um, would you mind sticking around for a minute or two? I think we have time for for a few questions before I have my next interview. So, um, yeah. All right. Excellent. So for everybody who's watching right now, um, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourselves. I just ask that you not speak over each other. You just try to ask ask your questions one at a time. Um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, this is Trisha Connolly. And Claire, I want to know what was it that you found helpful? Um, you know, how do you keep people going? Like when you say you had these efforts, you know, to close down the incinerator, what was it that you did to help keep people mobilized? Um, to get that ordinance passed? 
Oh, thanks for asking. I, so um, one thing about myself is I'm extremely goal oriented. So when, when Dr. Winnie and I were working on that, the first thing that I wanted to do is we looked, what was our goal and when did we want to get there by? We set a deadline because we knew uh, and worked backwards. And that's the way I would also approach um, some of my goals um, as a city council member. Uh, so I think that was really essential. So we set our goal. We knew by what date we, there was an absolute let, latest or drop dead date that we wanted to see the city council pass that ordinance and we worked backwards. And with that in mind, and everybody knew that. And so with that, we also were able to uh, really assess the situation. It took a huge amount of mobilizing, a huge amount of um, many, many people coming out. We knew we could all, you know, you could only rely on people coming out so many times before burnout. Um, so we really studied that and decided we could probably have people come out for so many gatherings and what every group could, would be able to do. And we worked backwards. We went to the committee, you know, we started the human, um, human services committee. We knew we had to get them to agree to move it up. Anyway, it was a, again, a very goal oriented step-by-step -step process that was, that we were able to keep people involved. People knew, they knew what the steps were, um, and they knew that this was going to happen soon. Um, we weren't, we were, and again, I think when people know that you're very serious and that you have an end game in mind and it's, and, and you, and you're going to, it's not just talk, it's not just protests, it's not just making noise, but they knew that we were going to have that thing closed within a year and we were committed to it. And every, all of our efforts were around meeting each of our benchmarks to ensure that that happened. And this was despite that people across the nation who had done before, they said, you'll never do it in less than five years. But we were determined and we set again, we set our goals, our month by month goals to ensure that we got to where we were going. And I think that really helps people to stay involved when they know how committed you are and that you have your, you know, your eye is on that prize and they know you're going for it and they know you've got a plan. So I think that was, um, I think that makes a big difference. And the same way I, you know, I do have a plan also for Northwestern. And I, I believe Northwestern um, will, does want to be a wonderful partner, to, and it is a wonderful partner to Evanston. But I know that, it, I, I'm, I'm certain that we can also work together. Um, I know we can work together to ensure that Northwestern also contributes more to our city. Uh, thank you, Tricia, for that question. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Claire, for joining us. Um, and uh, just a reminder to everybody, uh, the uh, endorsement ballots will go out on January 17th. Uh, they're due back in on January 23rd. Um, so if you're not a member yet, you can, uh, again, join on our website. Um, and uh, Claire, thank you so much. I just wanna you know, uh, wish you a, a good evening. Thank you, thank you, Greg.